Vedantism. At Khetri on 20th December 1897, Swami Vivekananda delivered a lecture on Vedantism in the hall of the Maharaja's bungalow in which he lodged with his disciples. The Swami was introduced by the Raja, who was the president of the meeting, and he spoke for more than an hour and a half. The Swami was at his best, and it was a matter of regret that no shorthand writer was present to report this interesting lecture at length. The following is a summary from notes taken down at the time. Two nations of yore, namely the Greek and the Aryan placed in different environments and circumstances, the former, surrounded by all that was beautiful, sweet and tempting in nature with an invigorating climate, and the latter, surrounded on every side by all that was sublime and born and nurtured in a climate which did not allow of much physical exercise developed to peculiar and different ideals of civilization. The study of the Greeks was the outer infinite, while that of the Aryans was the inner infinite, one studied the macrocosm and the other the microcosm. Each had its distinct part to play in the civilization of the world. Not that one was required to borrow from the other, but if they compared notes both would be the gainers. The Aryans were by nature an analytical race. In the sciences of mathematics and grammar wonderful fruits were gained and by the analysis of mind the full tree was developed. In Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato and the Egyptian Neoplatonists, we can find traces of Indian thought. The Swami then traced in detail the influence of Indian thought on Europe and showed how at different periods Spain, Germany and other European countries were greatly influenced by it. The Indian prince, Darashuko, translated the Upanishads into Persian and a Latin translation of the same was seen by Schopenhauer, whose philosophy was moulded by these. Next to him, the philosophy of Kant also shows traces of the teachings of the Upanishads. In Europe, it is the interest in comparative philology that attracts scholars to the study of Sanskrit, though there are men like Dusan who take interest in philosophy for its own sake. The Swami hoped that in future much more interest would be taken in the study of Sanskrit. He then showed that the word Hindu in former times was full of meaning, as referring to the people living beyond the Sindhu or the Indus, it is now meaningless, representing neither the nation nor their religion, for on this side of the Indus, various races professing different religions live at the present day. The Swami then dwelt at length on the Vedas and stated that they were not spoken by any person, but the ideas were evolving slowly and slowly until they were embodied in book form and then that book became the authority. He said that various religions were embodied in books, the power of books seemed to be infinite. The Hindus have their Vedas and will have to hold on to them for thousands of years more, but their ideas about them are to be changed and built anew on a solid foundation of rock. The Vedas, he said, were a huge literature. 99% of them were missing, they were in the keeping of certain families, with whose extinction the books were lost. But still, those that are left now could not be contained even in a large hall like that. They see we are written in language archaic and simple, their grammar was very crude, so much so that it was said that some part of the Vedas had no meaning. He then dilated on the two portions of the Vedas, the Karma Kanda and the Janana Kanda. The Karma Kanda, he said, were the Samhitas and the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas dealt with sacrifices. The Samhitas were songs composed in Chandas known as Anashtap, Krishtup, Jagti, etc. Generally they praised deities such as Varuna or Indra, and the question arose who were these deities and if any theories were raised about them, they were smashed up by other theories, and so on it went. The Swami then proceeded to explain different ideas of worship. With the ancient Babylonians, the soul was only a double, 
having no individuality of its own and not able to break its connection with the body. This double was believed to suffer hunger and thirst, feelings and emotions like those of the old body. Another idea was that if the first body was injured, the double would be injured also. When the first was annihilated, the double also perished, so the tendency grew to preserve the body, and thus mummies, tombs, and graves came into existence. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Jews never got any farther than this idea of the double, they did not reach to the idea of the Atman beyond. Professor Max Müller's opinion was that not the least trace of ancestral worship could be found in the Rigveda. There we do not meet with the horrid sight of mummies staring stark and blank at us. There the gods were friendly to man, communion between the worshipper and the worshipped was healthy. There was no moroseness, no want of simple joy, no lack of smiles or light in the eyes. The Swami said that dwelling on the Vedas, he even seemed to hear the laughter of the gods. The Vedic rishis might not have had finish in their expression, but they were men of culture and heart, and we are brutes in comparison to them. Swamiji then recited several mantras in confirmation of what he had just said, carry him to the place where the fathers live, where there is no grief or sorrow, etc. Thus the idea arose that the sooner the dead body was cremated the better. By degrees they came to know that there was a finer body that went to a place where there was all joy and no sorrow. In the Semitic type of religion there was tribulation and fear, it was thought that if a man saw God, he would die. But according to the Rigveda, when a man saw God face to face then began his real life. Now the questions came to be asked, what were these gods? Sometimes Indra came and helped man, sometimes Indra drank too much Soma. Now and again, adjectives such as all-powerful, all-pervading, were attributed to him, the same was the case with Varuna. In this way it went on, and some of these mantras depicting the characteristics of these gods were marvellous, and the language was exceedingly grand. The speaker here repeated the famous Nasdiya Sukta which describes the Pralaya state and in which occurs the idea of darkness covering darkness and asked if the persons that described these sublime ideas in such poetic thought were uncivilized and uncultured, then what we should call ourselves. It was not for him, Swamiji said, to criticize or pass any judgment on those rishis and their gods, Indra or Varuna. All this was like a panorama, unfolding one scene after another, and behind them all as a background stood out, that which exists is one, sages call it variously. The whole thing was most mystical, marvellous, and exquisitely beautiful. It seemed even yet quite unapproachable, the veil was so thin that it would rend, as it were, at the least touch and vanish like a mirage. Continuing, he said that one thing seemed to him quite clear and possible that the Aryans too, like the Greeks, went to outside nature for their solution, that nature tempted them outside, led them step by step to the outward world, beautiful and good. But here in India anything which was not sublime counted for nothing. It never occurred to the Greeks to pry into the secrets after death. But here from the beginning was asked again and again, What am I? What will become of me after death? There the Greek thought, the man died and went to heaven. What was meant by going to heaven? It meant going outside of everything, there was nothing inside, everything was outside, his search was all directed outside, nay. He himself was, as it were, outside himself. And when he went to a place which was very much like this world minus all its sorrows, he thought he had got everything that was desirable and was satisfied, and there all ideas of religion stopped. But this did not satisfy the Hindu mind. In its analysis, these heavens were all included within the material universe. 
whatever comes by combination, the Hindus said, dies of annihilation. They asked external nature, do you know what is soul? And nature answered, no. Is there any God? Nature answered, I do not know. Then they turned away from nature. They understood that external nature, however great and grand, was limited in space and time. Then there arose another voice, new sublime thoughts dawned in their minds. That voice said, Neti, Neti, not this, not this. All the different gods were now reduced into one, the suns, moons and stars, nay, the whole universe, were one, and upon this new ideal the spiritual basis of religion was built. There the sun doth not shine, neither the moon, nor stars, nor lightning, what to speak of this fire? He shining, everything doth shine. Through him everything sheeneth. No more is there that limited, crude, personal idea, no more is there that little idea of God sitting in judgment, no more is that search outside, but henceforth it is directed inside. Thus the Upanishads became the Bible of India. It was a vast literature, these Upanishads, and all the schools holding different opinions in India came to be established on the foundation of the Upanishads. The Swami passed on to the dualistic, qualified monistic, and Advaitic theories and reconciled them by saying that each one of these was like a step by which one passed before the other was reached, the final evolution to Advaitism was the natural outcome, and the last step was Tattvamsi. He pointed out where even the great commentators Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya and Mandhvacharya had committed mistakes. Each one believed in the Upanishads as the sole authority, but thought that they preached one thing, one path only. Thus Shankaracharya committed the mistake in supposing that the whole of the Upanishads taught one thing, which was Advaitism, and nothing else. And wherever a passage bearing distinctly the Dvaita idea occurred, he twisted and tortured the meaning to make it support his own theory. So with Ramanuj and Mandhvacharya when pure Advaitic texts occurred, it was perfectly true that the Upanishads had one thing to teach, but that was taught as a going up from one step to another. Swamiji regretted that in modern India the spirit of religion is gone, only the externals remain. The people are neither Hindus nor Vedantists. They are merely Dantitachists. The kitchen is their temple and Handi Bartans, cooking pots, are their Devta, object of worship. This state of things must go. The sooner it is given up, the better for our religion. Let the Upanishads shine in their glory, and at the same time let not quarrels exist amongst different sects. As Swamiji was not keeping good health, he felt exhausted at this stage of his speech, so he took a little rest for half an hour, during which time the whole audience waited patiently to hear the rest of the lecture. He came out and spoke again for half an hour and explained that knowledge was the finding of unity in diversity and the highest point in every science was reached when it found the one unity underlying all variety. This was as true in physical science as in the spiritual.